Uh, she's currently an um, associate. In 2007, she awarded a presidential early stage career grant for science and engineering. Uh, so, that's it. welcome. We look forward to your talk. Uh, hello, is this uh, the uh, yes, so I'm, I'm at the University of Washington. I'm actually on sabbatical at uh, Google this year, Google Research. And they have a, a special name for big data. Uh, they call it data. <laughs> uh, but today I'm going to talk about work uh, that I did in collaboration with one of my graduate students, Nathan Parrish, and uh, Hunter Anderson at Sandia National Labs. So we're talking about classifying uh, time signals. So I'm going to assume that you have sort of the basic setup. We've got some labeled uh, signals here. We've just got two classes, the class blue and the class red. And we'd like to be able to, to classify and tell these apart. Uh, we'll do some feature extraction. And uh, in this talk, we're not going to really care that much about how you do the feature extraction. And in particular, you might just take the, the actual values of the time series as your features, and, and that's OK. And then we'll build a classifier. So here's a classifier uh, just in two dimensions, uh, two dimensional feature space. These correspond to samples of the red signals, samples of the blue signals, and we have a linear decision boundary here. And then you'll get some test signal, uh, you'll extract its features, you'll see where it fits in the feature space, and you'll be like, oh yeah, I should classify that as blue. So the kind of problems we're interested in is when you have missing data. And the motivating problem here is trying to classify signals earlier or as soon as possible. So uh, here, we've only got 23 seconds of this test signal. Can we already make a call about what class we think it's going to be, and can we do that reliably? So I'm going to talk mostly about um, this sort of idea of classifying signals sooner. But really, everything I'm going to say is going to apply to any kind of incomplete or missing data that you might have. So you might be missing a chunk of the time series. You might be missing certain values. You might have data that's quantized in a way. So all of that stuff uh, will apply here. OK, so what do we do in this case when we don't have a full time series? Well, um, sort of a naive approach that, that you'll see people uh, do is that if you want to test at time t, then you could just build a classifier based on training data up to time t. So if I'm testing just on uh, data up to time uh, 23, then I'll just use my label training data up to time 23, and everything proceeds just as normal. OK, so th the first issue is we do have the future of the training data. Can we use that to our advantage? And it's not necessarily intuitively clear whether you can, uh, because you don't have the future of the test data here. But I'll, I'll show in this talk that, yes, in fact, we can, we can get away with uh, taking advantage of that. And the second issue is that we don't just want to classify time 23. We want to classify when we're ready. Um, in particular, this, this work is, uh, is, is funded uh, uh, through idea, and they're interested in, uh, can, we, can we shoot that plane yet? So they really want to know. Um, is this an enemy target? And they want to know that as soon as possible, but they want to know reliably. And they want to have some idea how reliable uh, you are. So they don't necessarily want to classify at time 23. They want to classify it when you're ready. And we're going to use this term reliability. This is a little different than accuracy. In classification, you want to know, am I right? Here we're going to worry about, would I get the same answer if I waited? If I had the full 100 second test signal, I'm going to make some classification decision. If I make that decision now, is it going to be the same? And I don't really need to wait. OK, so, um, so we're going to assume that you have this incomplete test signal Z up to some, some time. And then this pink signal here is the rest of the signal. You don't know it, and you don't have access to it. But what we're going to do is model it as random. This is a you know, general thing to do with uncertain things. And we're going to model it as, as uh, random, given, uh, sorry, the, given the test signal Z here, that should be is missing, and given the training signals that we've seen. So given that you've seen the future training signals, you have some idea of what's going to happen here. You, you know that this guy's probably not going to go like this, because you never saw anything like that in your training data. So we're going to use the training data in that way to, to make some guesses about what the distribution of the future test signal will look like. And based on that feature distribution, we can make a distribution for the random features, uh, given what we've seen and given the training signals. So these random features, again, might just be the rest of the test, the time signal, if you're going to classify on the time series itself. Or it might be features like, well, I'd really like to know the uh, maximum amplitude over the whole time, or the bandwidth. And so I'll, uh, I'll create a distribution randomly for those. OK, so then our goal is, uh, if we have a desired reliability, <coughs> some number, let's say 0 0.95, 95%, we'd like to classify our incomplete test signal Z 
as uh, class G. If there's a class G, that's going to be the final class uh, with probability tau. So if if I'm 95% confident that if I waited, I'm going to classify this as class blue, then I should go ahead and classify it as class blue now. So let's try to make that a little more precise mathematically. Um, so we would we could have a, a policy. This is going to give it a desired reliability. And now I'm going to assume I've been given a classifier, uh, which is some function c that takes a feature vector and maps it to a class. And I'd like to classify my incomplete signal z uh, as some class g <coughs> as soon as the probability that the classifier is going to be that class g is greater than or equal to power of the library. So just saying the same thing, just adding a little notation here. And uh, let's look at what that ideal policy means. So again, I've seen z. I, based on the training data of what I've seen, I create this distribution in my feature space. Px given z here is sort of uh, reddish thing that says where I think my signal features are going to lie once I see them all. And now I have my decision boundary uh, trained on all my data, the black line here. And I'm just saying, well, if most of this measure, most of this probability lies on this side, uh, say 95%, and I want 95% reliability, I can just go ahead and classify. <coughs> Uh, so here, for example, I would definitely be like, yeah, at any reliability tau, I can go ahead and classify. Uh, here, maybe I'm not sure that I can classify yet, and I might have to wait uh, so I get a little more uh, uh, specific knowledge about the time series. Okay, so this is a this is a great idea. This is what we'd like to be able to do. It's unfortunately computationally intractable, um, and the problem is that you have to figure out not only do you need to know this distribution, but even if you knew this distribution, you've got to go through and test: is there any set of measure tau? That lies on one side of the decision map. So, is there any set of like measure probability of 0.95 that lies on, on that side of the decision map? So, it's difficult to actually implement. So, I'll tell you something that we can implement, and we're going we're to approximate the ideal policy. We're going to approximate in a more conservative way, so we're going to be safer and more robust than, uh, than we would be if we were ideal. So, again, we've got a desired reliability you want to achieve, you've got a classifier, and now we're going to assume that you can create a set A. And that that set A is going to have 95% of the probability of the random features. And then we're going to classify, if the classifier would say, yeah, call it for G for all of the X in that set A. So let's look at that pictorially, uh, just in a two-dimensional feature space. So I've got this set A, and I don't really have to know what the distribution is. I just have to know that tau of the distribution, say 95%, is going to be in set A. And then if set A is on one side of the decision boundary, I'm good. Okay, so um, here, for example, I know that 95% of the distribution is in set A, but it's crossing the decision boundary, so I can't call it yet. I'm not, I'm not confident enough. Okay, so how does this really differ from the ideal policy? It's a little subtle. Here's an example where here's the true distribution, and you see set A captures 95% of that distribution. If I were doing the ideal policy, I would look at this distribution and be like, oh yeah, that's all on, on this side. I can call it. I can call it for that class. But if I'm asking, uh, about set A, set A crosses the boundary, so I can't call it yet. So this policy will always be more conservative. And the real difference is in the ideal policy, you're going to call it if any 95%, any tau measure is on one side of the decision boundary. Here I've got a specific set A that I'm going to look at, and that set A has to be on the right side of the decision boundary. But that makes it a lot easier to check. I just have to check if set A is on the decision boundary. Okay, so in practice, there's are two steps. We've got to estimate that distribution, and then we have to do this check. And we can do that really sort of, uh, uh, yeah, well, well, let's see how we can actually implement that. So I haven't talked about what kind of classifier I want to use. And in fact, I, I to the most part, don't care. Um, what I do need, though, is a classifier model that looks like this, that has some class discriminant fg of x. So for the g's class, you get sort of some score of how strong you think that's the right class. And then I'm going to go through my classifier that says, well, choose the class g that has the biggest discriminant. So generative models will fit this model. Uh, your discrete will be a probability or a log likelihood. SVMs fit this model. You'll have a, a linear and RBF kernel discriminant. Neural nets will fit this model. I think we can make uh, trees fit this model. I haven't tried. Nearest neighbor will fit this model, so. So if this is our, our model, then this check here becomes classify as class G if the discriminant for the G class is bigger than the discriminant for some other class for all of the X in that set A. So again, my set A has 95% of the probability. So if for all of the signals in that 95% probability, then I know my, I've got the right discriminant with 95% probability at least. So I can go ahead and classify. Um, let's just look at that. So if, if this, for example, is my set A, I need the discriminant for class G to always be bigger than the discriminant for class H. 
then I'm good and I can go ahead and classify with, with the reliability tau. Okay, so we can turn that into an optimization problem by just saying if this needs to be always bigger than this guy, I just need to make sure that the difference is never less than zero. So I just need to look at what is the smallest difference um, over x constrained to be in the set A between the two discriminants, and that'll be good. Okay, so again, there's sort of uh, three steps here. We're going to use our observed incomplete test signal and our training feature vectors to estimate our distribution over the features. Then we're going to construct the set A that captures tau the probability of that random distribution. And then we're going to uh, solve this optimization problem for all parent classes. Um, not necessarily. Uh, we're going to solve this optimization problem a bunch of times to see uh, can we classify it? Is set A really just one class? So just a quick comment about how we estimate that distribution. Um, so again, you're, you're given sort of the Z, it's incomplete, you're given all the future uh, training data, and uh, we've tried a couple things. We've tried making just a jointly Gaussian assumption, uh, that works pretty well, and we've tried making a Gaussian mixture model assumption. Uh, I tend to not like mixture models because you have to deal with how many components and a bunch of stuff to estimate. This one's very simple though, because we're going to have one mixture component per class, so that you don't have to worry about estimating how many uh, mixtures. Okay, uh, so after we estimate, we construct a set. So how do we construct a set? Um, one of the simplest things you can do is the Chebyshev inequality. So you estimate the mean and, and covariance of your distribution over the random features based on your training data. And recall the, the Chebyshev inequality says that as long as that mean and covariance are finite, then the probability that, uh, that you have at least tau of the probability is true if you find a set that looks like this. So all x close to that mean and that, that inverse covariance, uh, you get uh, uh, less, than, less than some loop here. So you'll get some set A that looks elliptical or looks quadratic uh, like that. Okay, and the Chebyshev inequality doesn't make any assumptions about the distribution, which is really nice, except it's also kind of loose. So if you start making assumptions about the distribution, if you're willing to assume that this is Gaussian, then you can make tighter constrained sets here and say, well, I know that this captures at least 95 or tau percent of the probability. Okay. Um, so we estimate our distribution. We manage to construct a set in the feature space that captures a lot of that probability. And now we just need to go and check this con constraint. Well, um, the way that I suggest we construct the set A uh, either gets us a quadratic set A or uh, a set A here that's a rectangular box that we can describe as a set of linear constraints. So that means that this optimization problem is an optimization over either a quadratic or a linear constraint set. So that's nice. And um, this objective here is the difference between two class discriminants. So if my class discriminants are linear, that objective is still going to be linear, so this is going to be a very easy problem to solve. Uh, for a lot of classifiers, um, these objective, these Objective functions is discriminants might be quadratic, and so I'll get a, a quadratic function over a quadratic constraint set or over a linear constraint set. Okay. So depending on what you choose, um, if you choose uh, linear objectives and quadratic constraints or linear constraints and quadratic objectives or linear linear, you can get an analytic solution. The only problem is if you try to choose uh, quadratic discriminants and a quadratic constraint set, then you don't have a linear problem. Um, you actually end up with a non-convex quadratically constrained quadratic program. And just some, some details on that. Uh, it, it's a QCQP, so even though it's non-convex, the dual is convex. Uh, you can solve it. It's an STP, a semi-definite program, but it is fairly slow. So we tried solving it that way. We found we could get just as accurate results uh, a couple orders of magnitude faster uh, by solving the trust region subproblems in gradient descent. So that's what we uh, what we actually did. Okay, so. Um, yeah, so using like a linear support vector machine or a quadratic discriminant analysis classifier, you get these quadratic discriminants that tell you how strongly you believe that each uh, feature vector belongs to each class. Okay, so if I just have two classes, I just need to check this once, f1 of x against f2 of x. But if I have 100 classes that I'm trying to differentiate from, you might be a little worried and say, well, wait a second, do I have to check all possible handshakes to see if there's some class that's dominating already? And so we were a little concerned that this would scale as g squared, or as the number of classes squared. But in fact, you don't have to check everything, because once, once a class is sort of lost, it can't be the right class. And so you, it turns out that this really scales linearly in the number of classes. So it's really quite efficient. 
Um, I'm going to show you some uh, example experiments, and uh, I find experiments much less interesting than the actual idea, so I, I won't spend too much time <laughs> on uh, experimental results, but I'll try to show you representative uh, results. Um, and they're going to look uh, a, lot like, a lot like this. So this is going to be average classification time on the x-axis, and this is going to be our reliability. So 100% reliability means you got the same answers if you had waited for the full time series. And the classifier I'll use throughout is a quadratic discrete analysis classifier. So that means that for each class sample, you fit one Gaussian. And then for a test sample, you ask which, which class is Gaussian is this guy more likely to have come from. It. So a problem with quadratic discrete analysis is that it has very high model bias. It, you know, you, you uh, model your whole class is being generated by one Gaussian. So a lot of people use Gaussian mixture models to get around that. But we think a different technique uh, works as well or better than Gaussian mixture models and is much simpler to implement uh, called local QDA. And what you do is you take your test sample, you find the k-nearest neighbor training samples, so maybe like 100 k-nearest neighbor training samples near it, and you do QDA just on that local neighborhood. So that gives you the flexibility of, of something like a Gaussian mixture model without having to um, actually fit a Gaussian mixture model to the whole space where maybe you never even had a test sample of it. Okay, so again, we're going to look at classification time and test reliability, and then there'll be sort of different markers here for different tau's. So the furthest right one will say, like, tau equals 0.9. If I ask you for 90% reliability, this says, um, I was willing to give you 90% reliability on average after 46 seconds, and on the test data, I actually achieved 99.9% reliability. So I was concerned. Okay, so this first uh, experiment shows you the difference between those different constraint sets, how we choose to constrain the set A that tries to capture tau of the probability. So we talked the most about the Chebyshev A, so that's going to be quadratic, and you see that here in the black. Um, these other two are the ones that make the assumption that the distribution is Gaussian. Um, this one is a marginal uh, Gaussian assumption, this is a joint Gaussian assumption. And this pink one is, is the best in the sense that this furthest right mark here is where you have a reliability of 90%. So on the pink one, you asked for reliability of 90%, you actually got a reliability of 99.9%, and you got it fastest. You got it after 46 seconds, whereas with this other constraint set, it took you 54 seconds on average to be confident that you had met that reliability guarantee. So moving forward, I'll, uh, I'll work with this pink line, that is we'll create a constraint set by making a Gaussian assumption and, uh, and an any phase approach. Um, and uh, I talked a little bit about solving for that. Uh, it does take a little longer to solve for that because you have to solve that QCQP. The box constraint is linear, so it's super, super simple, uh, a bit faster, but um, we, we went for what was working better. Okay, in this comparison, I'm comparing how do we predict that distribution over the random features for the testing that we haven't seen. I talked about either making a, a Gaussian assumption or a Gaussian mixture model assumption, and here we see the Gaussian mixture model assumption um, I think the every data set we looked at does at least slightly better. So you're able to classify earlier more reliably. <laughs> and now I'm going to propose to some, uh, compare to some other methods. So again, the, what we're proposing here. And the two naive approaches I talked about at the beginning, that if you want to classify at time 23, you just use all the training data up to time 23. And we'll do that either with local QDA, so the exact same classifier, and we'll do that with uh, one nearest neighbor. And then the fourth classifier, uh, we haven't found a lot of related work looking at this problem, but there is this work from uh, Jing et al. in 2011. It's sort of a reverse nearest neighbor approach. Um, they call it early classification on time series, and so that's why we were comparing also with nearest neighbor. So uh, here's an example on, on the wafer data set. So as we go over time, our test reliability, and uh, we see that you want 90% reliability, and we were confident here, it took us an average test time of about 60 seconds uh, to give you that, and we were reliable um, about 99.9%. Uh, the other methods uh, took a lot longer to get you that much classification. Um, so this pink line is QDA, and it's just QDA at 60, 60 seconds on every single time series. So why is it that we can do better when we're using the same local QDA classifier at 60 seconds? Well, this is an average. So this says, Sometimes we were ready to uh, classify after 10 seconds. We were confident at 10 seconds. Sometimes we waited a full 100 seconds. But by checking for this, uh, checking these statistical assumptions, we were able to make a good call about when we should classify. And on average, it took us 60 seconds. Whereas this quick line classified everything exactly at 60 seconds. 
And so sometimes that, that hurt you, and you get to the worst performance. Uh, the ECTS, um, it waits, and then it tells you when it's ready to classify. So there's only one point for that. And it took a lot longer to classify and didn't achieve the same reliability. And that's, um, again, pretty representative of what we see. Um, here's a second comparison. Uh, again, our approach at, at different reliability guarantees is classifying more reliably and earlier uh, than these other approaches. Uh, here's just a, a third comparison, and again, uh, pretty much the same uh, experience here. The ECTS does do better than the nearest neighbor uh, most of the time, but it doesn't do as well as the, the better classifiers. Okay, so what I've shown you is an efficient and uh, reliable method for classifying time series data early. One of the problems we have is that we're a little too conservative. So you ask for 95% reliability, we tend to give you 99.9% reliability. You ask for 25% reliability, we tend to give you 99% reliability. <laughs> so uh, we've been working on, on trying to fix that, and that has to do with how you define that constraint set A, trying to get that to be more accurate. Okay, um, all the experiments I showed you were based on actually classifying the time signal from the time signal values. Uh, you could use whatever features you wanted, for example, bandwidth, amplitude, rise time, these sorts of things. Uh, but we just haven't done those experiments yet, but the math all holds. One issue with using time signals is that the feature vector gets very long. So as Ian was talking about, um, you can end up with millions of, of time signals or even uh, billions. And uh, what we do about that is we're working on reducing the dimensionality. So you can reduce the dimensionality however you wanted. You can use principal components analysis. Um, but there are methods to do it with a supervised way. So you reduce the dimensionality in a way that's good for the classification problem you're trying to solve. And so um, we have a, a new state-of-the-art approach with that. It'll come out in ICML. Um, and that helps us achieve uh, more efficient results from these kinds of data sets. Um, and uh, that's why I'd like to stop. Thank you. We, we have time for a few questions. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so who said that you were drafting the last few slides yeah, so um, uh, we're using uh, Ewan Kuk, the plenary speaker today, has a wonderful curated uh, public available uh, repository of, of data sets, and so we've been using all of the data sets, and I have full cool results on, on uh, most of those. Um, the ones that I've shown you here are pretty short. This one, for example, the, the full time series is only 99 long. Now, I don't care if that's 99 seconds or 99 milliseconds as long as you know, I had 99 uh, pieces of data, right? Um, this example is 128 long. This example is 152 long. So those are very short time series data sets. Um, when you get up to past about 10,000, things start to really slow down. Um, and it depends on what you want to do. Here I've shown you everything with a quadratic classifier, QDA, and quadratic constraint set, the Chevy uh, the Gaussian constraint set. So we had to actually solve the optimization problems. But if you use a linear constraint set, like the, um, if you use this box constraint set here in, in, in Cyan, uh, you see it does really almost as well. And it's linear, and so you get analytic solutions, so things become much faster. And uh, as I said, what we've been doing lately is looking at dimensionality reduction techniques. So that instead of when you start with this you know, million long data set, you can bring it down to you know, 10 dimensions or 100 dimensions that you think are important. And then you only have to create this distribution of the random features in that 10 or 100 dimensional small, small features. So, so do you know that efficient model that that is that's right. That's why I'm just wondering what you mean by efficient. Um, yes. It, I mean, a robot can handle that. can have quite a bit of uh, processing power. So, um, yes. Uh, what do I mean by efficient? Mm. Uh, yeah. I mean that, that at worst it's a quadratic program um, that you can set this up as a linear program. You can set up with that other solutions. <coughs> um, and uh, with the child, you actually can make it really as efficient as, as you want. Sure. One of the interesting uh, questions in the context of dimensionality reduction uh, would be learning when is it need to recompute features um, so that uh, each time step effectively 
that would cost higher, but they could use different features entirely. But it may be that after you know the first five sets, you freeze you know the first ten features because you know you learned from your units that you don't need actually to do those. But if you thought about the computational efficiency of uh, feature generation in the context of this problem. Um, no, not really. Uh, the dimension side regression we've been, been doing is uh, like a lot of the folks in the machine learning looking at linear projections <coughs> and really just looking at linear projections from the, from the full data down to what would I want. Um, so you're doing not feature selection, but really dimensionality reduction. And so the freezing or feature selection would, would be nice and yeah, we have a nice chance to look at that. Yeah, I think a lot of the problems that we're dealing with <coughs> with others is that the hard computational part of it or the long computational part of it is just in the feature generation from the data. Um, because you can not have to generate Great. Let's thank Myra again. I'm sorry we don't have time for more questions. Thanks.